If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers will get them to you. And um, there we go. Praise the Lord if you need a Bible. Uh, so a couple things about me. I, I was on staff here years ago. I was a, I was a children's director. I was a youth uh, director, junior high director. Then I became the, the campus pastor for New York City. And then Pastor Ronald took over my job. And, and he's doing way better. He looks better. Well, I don't know if he looks better, but but he's doing a better job than, than I did. And uh, some of you don't remember, last time you saw me, I had hair or a little. And I, I did the comb over, but, but I, I shaved it. And I've been told I look like Tyson Fury, but I think Nate Wilder looks more like Tyson Fury than I do. I just wish I had Tyson Fury's money. If you don't know who he is, he's the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. My family's with me this morning, my beautiful wife, Jessica, my youngest son, Zeke. When we left, he wasn't born. He's five years old. My beautiful daughter, Ashlyn, and my, my oldest son, Justice, who is now taller than me and uh, because he has hair. That's, that's the reason he's taller than me. So two years ago, we were um, going to be, I was scheduled to preach two years ago to come to church and, and be the guest speaker. It was almost exactly two years ago. And some of you might remember our flight got delayed and delayed and delayed, and then it got canceled. And then the family couldn't come. And I took a flight out to, to be here for the weekend two years ago. Well, Friday came and the same exact scenario started to happen again. And we get, uh, we start to leave our driveway to come to, to Faith to get on the airplane to the airport. And we get an email delayed, another email delayed. So five hours later, we finally get on the plane and we get here and uh, we're excited to be here and um, excited to preach the word. How many believe that you have the greatest pastors on the planet this morning? Amen. <laughs> Pastor Frank and Pastor Lisa. They are fantastic people. They're awesome pastors and, and their family, Pastor Lisa, I mean, Pastor Nicole, Pastor Joey, awesome. We had a great time to hang out with them yesterday and, and just so honored and gracious to be here. Pastor Frank and Lisa, if you're watching, love you so very much. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Mark chapter six, if you can open up your Bibles to Mark chapter six, one through six. It says this, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and his own home. He cannot do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from the village, teaching from village to village. This morning, I want to talk to you about being in a dead end. Jesus finds himself being in a dead end situation. Have you ever been in on a dead end before, dead end situation? Maybe have you ever traveled on a dead end? I grew up on a dead end in Richfield, Connecticut. It was 59 Acre Lane, Richfield, Connecticut, 06877. All you are going to Google where I used to live when I was a kid and grew up and all that kind of stuff. And, but it was a dead end road. And when you got to the end of the dead end road, you had to make a decision. You can either stay there or you can turn around. And Jesus finds himself in a dead end situation. A lot of times we will find ourselves in a dead end situation. Maybe it's a dead end situation in our job, or maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's a dead end situation just in life in general. And God will give us signs. How do you know that you're in a dead end situation? Well, a lot of times the road will actually say dead end. There'll be a U-turn sign at the end of the road and you've got to make that decision. And Jesus will often give us signs to tell us that we're in a dead end situation. He'll give us an understanding. He'll give us a revelation for our life. And he's saying, hey, listen, here's your sign. It's time for you to make a U-turn. And he gives us these signs so that we're never trapped. He doesn't want us to live in a trapped situation. He wants us to be able to go freely and to do what he has called us to do. How many know that because you're a child of God, that you are able to move forward? You're able to go beyond your personal limits because God has given you the ability to go beyond. God doesn't want you to be trapped. God doesn't want you to be stuck in a place. I love what Robert Froster Bennett said. He said, a, a dead end can never be a one-way street. 
you can always turn around and take another road. Now, we all have backup cameras in our cars now, or at least most of us have backup cameras. I was driving a car the other day that didn't have a backup camera, and I literally waited. I looked at the dash, waiting for the backup camera to come on, and I just waited and stared at it for like 10, like, oh, this has no camera on it, right? But y'all remember when you had to make a U-turn or a backup situation, you flung your arm back over the right side of that car seat, you turned around, boom, and you pressed the gas pedal, and you backed up. God is saying, it's time for you to back up out of a bad situation. It's time for you to put your arm around that right side of the, of the car and put that arm over the right side of the seat and back up, turn your head, put your rear view camera on, put your gear shift. Do they still make cars with gear shifts on the column anymore? I don't know if I'm, if I'm dating myself or aging myself, but, but it's time to put it in reverse. It's time to back up. It's time to make a U-turn. How many of you started 2023 believing that this was going to be your breakthrough year? Believing that this was going to be an amazing year? Believing that this was going to be the best year that you've ever had? Believing that this was going to be the best financial year? That this was going to be the best healthiest year? That this was going to be the best year for your family? Best year in your job? Best year spiritually in your life? And then all of a sudden, somewhere you have found yourself stuck at a dead end. Somewhere you found yourself taking a wrong road. But I want to remind you this morning that 2023 is not over. Because with one simple turn, with one press of the gas pedal, with one shifting of the gear, you can make a U-turn and turn this whole thing around. I still believe that 2023 is going to be the best year that we've ever experienced. That's going to be the best year that we've ever had in our health. That's going to be the best year that we've ever had mentally, spiritually, physically, in our families. You see, it's time to make a U-turn. It's time to turn this ship around. It's time to put it in reverse. I want to give you a couple examples of some dead-end situations found in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah was a dead-end situation for a whole civilization. It was a dead-end situation, and he had called a few, and he said, it's time to get out of there. You've got to make a U-turn. Abraham was in a dead-end family. His father had settled in a place that God had never intended him to settle. And God speaks to Abraham and he says, hey, listen, just because your father had settled here doesn't mean I've called you to settle here. I've called you to go further. Abraham, it's time to make a U-turn and go to a place that I've made for you. Matthew, the tax collector. He's sitting in his tax booth and Jesus finds him in his tax booth and Jesus walks up to him and he says, Matthew, I haven't called you to sit in this dead end job for the rest of your life. Instead of putting people down with taxes, I have called you to set people free. It's time to preach the gospel. And he comes out of a dead end situation. You see, God will find you in your present and he will point to your future. But it's up to us to make the decision that we're going to go where God has called us to go. And so this morning, I've got a little bit of a a little bit of some, I got to put my Bible over here because I don't want it to get wet. Y'all see what I'm about to do in just a second. Jesus, he finds himself in a dead end situation. But before he finds himself in a dead end situation, Jesus starts to do amazing things in not just his life, but in the life of people that follow him. Mark chapter one, verse 34, it says, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases he also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Mark chapter one, Jesus starts performing miracles and he starts uh, going into his earthly ministry and things just start to happen. But why do things start to happen? It's not like Jesus just decided one day, okay, I'm 30 years old. Now it's going to start to happen. Something happened in his life where things radically shifted, where things radically changed. Do you know what that was? It was the 40 day experience was Jesus went to the mountaintop where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. No food for 40 days. No food for 40 nights. He goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by the enemy three different times, by Satan three different times. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. And he casts the Satan down. He says, listen, we can't do this. We're not going to walk this way. But we can't even survive 40 minutes without food, can't we? I mean, we see a Chick-fil-A. We're like, pull over. 
For me, we, y'all don't have Krispy Kreme up here in the north, do you? Y'all got Krispy Kreme stores anywhere? We do. There's Krispy Kreme. Yeah, anybody know what a Krispy Kreme is? Raise your hand if you know. That fresh hot light comes on. I don't care what you're doing. I'll sideswipe you. Burr, pulling in. Right? If y'all don't know what Krispy Kreme is, the best donut on the planet. And you got to get them hot and fresh because it's just, it just goos and ooze the glory of God. Okay? And so... <laughs> But you can't have too many of them because then you're going you're gonna to have to stay, take diabetes medicine. But we can't go 40 minutes. And Jesus goes 40 days without food. He goes 40 days without water. He goes 40 days in the wilderness. He goes 40 days being tempted by the enemy. And he comes down from the mountain. And he comes down with power. He comes down with anointing. He comes down and he walks in his, 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 his path. He walks in the way that God wants him to walk. And Jesus just starts to do things. Everywhere he goes, he starts to pour out his anointing on people so that they can be free. And he starts pouring it because Jesus is the water of life. And he keeps pouring and he keeps pouring. And it says that he healed many. And it says that he delivered people from demons and demon possession. And he just keeps pouring and pouring and pouring. Jesus has got miracle after miracle after miracle. During the first five chapters, Jesus is just on fire. He's lit. He's killing it. Have you ever just been in a spot in your life where just everything was just, just working right? Every I was dotted. Every T was crossed. Everything. I mean, like you're driving down a road and you hit every green light. And then, man, it's just awesome. Light after light after light. You're making great time. Jesus is just killing it. And he gets to chapter two and he heals this man. Now, if you know this story, Jesus, this is one of the most craziest stories that I've ever heard in the Bible. He heals this man that comes through the roof. Imagine right now, just imagine I'm preaching and the roof just opens up and this guy just starts to come down right here in the middle of the room. That's exactly the situation. Mark chapter two, verse five through 12. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does, his fellow, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, Jesus, knew, his, uh, Jesus knew his spirit that this was the, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed men, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man is not, the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Get up. And he got up and took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now in this situation, it's not the man's faith that got him healed. It's the boy's faith. It's the friend's faith that got this man healed. And because of their faith, Jesus could do more. Jesus is the living water. He's got everything to cleanse you. He can not just forgive your sins, but he can also heal your body. And he's pouring out and he's pouring out and he's pouring out. And he's able to do this because of their faith. Because of their faith, he's able to pour out into their lives. I'm here to remind somebody that all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. Not just a little dab will do you, not just a little bit, but God, God says all things. I, I not just can only heal his body, but I can forgive his sins. And it goes on and it actually says that he read their mind or he heard them talking in their mind. You see, Jesus just doesn't have the ability to heal your body. He doesn't just have the ability to heal your soul and to forgive you. He's got the ability to even hear and read your thoughts. You see, Jesus is everywhere, all the time, present, every day, at every moment. He knows your hurts and he knows your pains. He knows what you're going through. And he says, I am the living water. And he's got blessings for you because of your belief in him. And then we get to chapter three. Chapter three, things start to shift a little bit. It says, 
For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. In the beginning of that chapter, it actually Jesus meets a man with a crippled hand. You all know this story. Jesus meets a man on a crippled hand. And the Pharisees were upset because it was the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, you're not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to sit there and rest. And Jesus tells the man to stretch forth his hand. Jesus, you look at the water jug and you think Jesus is empty. Y'all can see it underneath, but Jesus has got more where that came from. He says, stretch out your hand. And he keeps pouring into people's lives because he is the living water. He is the one that can cleanse. He is the one that can forgive. He is the one that can heal. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the time. And he's there and he's doing it. Why? Because he loves you, but he's able to do it because of their belief. And Jesus is doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And so the man stretches forth his hand and his crippled hand becomes perfect. It becomes straightened. You see, he will strengthen your stretch. When you think you can't go any further, all you've got to do is stretch out as much as you can and he grabs you by the hand and he will straighten your stretch. But it says a few verses later, it says, for he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Now, if you came to church, maybe some of y'all, and I'm not anybody, but maybe y'all, y'all came to church because you heard that Chris Lewis is going to be in the house. Most of you probably didn't because I know how Pastor Frank operates. He doesn't like to let anybody know who's preaching. And, and, and so and, unless it's like Jesse DePlanis or somebody big wig, I'm not a big wig. But, but if you came here this morning to hear me preach, you came for the wrong reason. If you came to hear anybody preach, you came for the wrong reason. But you pushed through. You push through the dishes on the counter and in the sink. Why? Because you needed to get to the miracle working God. You pushed through the lawn having to be mowed. Why? Because you came to honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You you pushed through the dirty dishes. You you pushed through the laundry. Why? Because you had to get in his presence. You you pushed through the headache and the pain that you're going through physically. Why? Because you needed to get to the one that can heal you. You need to touch the living God. You pushed through. We got any pushers in the house? Because if you're a pusher this morning, today is your day. Today is your day to push past what you're going through to get what God has for you because he's got miracle. He's got miracle after miracle after miracle in your life. He's got healing for you. He's got blessings for you. He's got forgiveness for you. He's got grace for you. You push past the enemy telling you that today is going to be another Sunday and you respond to the enemy and you say, not today, devil. Today is my day. Today is the Lord's day. And then we get to chapter four. Jesus is killing it. Everywhere he goes, miracle after miracle after miracle. Mark chapter four, verse 39 through 41. He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this even that the wind and the waves obey him? I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to make sure that you've got the right people in your boat. Because if you got the wrong people in your boat, they're going to say bad things. If you got the wrong people in your life, you're not going to experience the refreshing water, the living water. But if you got the right people in your boat, it's going to be amazing. And Jesus speaks to the wind and he speaks to the storm. 
You've got to have people in your life, despite of the, the, the raging storm in your mind that's causing you anxiety and depression and rage and disappointment and heartache and fear. You've got to speak to the storm. Better yet, you've got to have Jesus speak to your storm. You've got to have friends in your life that are willing to speak the word of God in the storm, that are willing to speak the word of God in your atmosphere, that are willing to speak the word of God and the word of God not just to you, but in you. And when you have that, God is able to do miracles. Why is it so important to have the right people on your boat? Y'all know Jonah? Jonah, the one that was swallowed by a whale? Y'all know what happened while he was swallowed by a whale? Because he stepped on a boat in disobedience, trying to run from God in unbelief in doubt that God could do a miracle. And because he was on the boat, the wrong person was on the boat. The whole boat was then jeopardized and everybody was going to die. And they threw him off the boat. But when you get the right person on your boat, when you get the right people around you, guess what? That person stands up and they speak to your song. Hey, baby, you're going to make it. Tomorrow is another day. Guess what? You're blessed and highly favored. Guess what? You're anointed. You can do the job. Guess what? You ain't going to die of that sickness, that cancer, that disease. Hey, baby, guess what? We're going to make it. We're going to go another day. Peace be still. And Jesus just keeps pouring and he keeps pouring and he keeps pouring and he keeps pouring because he's the living water. Then we get to chapter five. Chapter five is an amazing chapter. Starts off in the chapter and Jesus heals the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all know the story of the woman that was healed with the issue of blood. She, was, she had this issue, she had this, this blood disease for many years. And, and she goes and she finds out that Jesus is going to be here. The stories of Jesus in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 finally reach her shoreline, reach her life. And she says, i got to meet this man. And she reaches out and she, push, she pushes past the people. She reaches and she touches the hem of his garment and she's instantly healed. You know the story. Jesus turns around and he says, who touched me? But then it goes on to say, because the whole reason that Jesus had went to Capernaum anyways was to heal this man's daughter, Jairus. It says in chapter 5, verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were, very com they were completely astonished. You see, God wants to do a miracle in your family. You've got some things that are dying that God doesn't want dead. But you've also got people in your life that are causing the death because of their doubt and their disbelief. And Jesus gets to the situation and he gets to the situation and he sees this commotion and he sees people crying and weeping. He says, what's going on? And this little girl supposedly was dead. And Jesus says, that she's not dead, she's just asleep. And they start laughing at him. And they start laughing at his faith. They start laughing at the faith of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and his wife. You know what Jesus does? He kicks them out of their house. He says, unbelief and doubt can't live here. Mom and dad, you're believing for a miracle for your child right now. 
And you've got people surrounding you and your family that have disbelief, that have doubt, that have unbelief. It's time for them to be gone. It's time to kick them out. Why? Because the miracle that God wants to give you is dependent on the faith that's around you. And God wants to bless you. And he takes the hand of this father and this mother and he brings them to the daughter and he lays hands on her and she gets up. Mom and dad, be careful who's around your kids. Be careful what's being spoken around your kids. Be careful with where your kids go to school. There's a wonderful Christian school here at Faith Church called Faith Prep. I graduated from Faith Prep. It made me the person that I am today. Why? Because it built a thing in me. I had teachers speaking in me. I had pastors speaking in me. I had people laying hands on me. It wasn't just your run-of-the-mill Christian school. It was an anointed Christian place that blessed me. And because of that, my family is blessed. You see, you've got to be careful with who you allow around you. Who is around you that is causing some disbelief in your heart? And now we get to the main text. And Jesus left there and he went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Pause. Jesus is killing it. Chapter, he comes down from the mountain, 40 days of fasting, 40 days of praying. He's anointed. He's anointed to go wherever where he goes, that he's going to do miracle, that people's are, people are going to be healed and touched and delivered and set free and forgiven. And he does it in chapter one. He does it in chapter two. He does it in chapter three. He does it in chapter four. He does it in chapter five. And we get to chapter six. And all of a sudden, Jesus finds himself in a dead end situation. Man, what changed? It says, where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that he's been get, that's been given him? Where are these remarkable miracles he is, that he's been performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? Now, I want to pause right there because I want to give you a little comedic break right now. How many of you thought that Jesus was an only child? Just be honest. Anybody thought Jesus was the only child? Jesus ain't an only child. He's got how many brothers? He's got, well, let's see here. He's got James. He's got Joseph. He's got Judas. He's got Simon. And then he's got sisters. There's four brothers. There's five boys living in this house. And then he's got sisters. And we don't even know how many sisters because it's at least two, but they don't even name them. So it's probably even more. And then what I started to think was, man, Mary and Joseph, goodness gracious, they must have liked each other a lot. And, and Jesus understands your pain. You know, either Mary and Joseph hated each other or they liked each other. Why would you say that they hate each other? Because you know the best thing to do when you break up is to make up. Come on, somebody. Jesus knows your pain. Anybody grow up in a large, a large family? Raise your hand if you've got a lot of brothers and sisters. A lot of brothers and sisters, right? In my house, there's three, there's three, I got three kids. And in our house, we have three full baths. My two older two, they, they live upstairs and they have their own kind of area and they've got their own bathroom. My youngest son, he's got his own bathroom. And me and my wife, we have to share a bathroom. But when we come home from shopping, my kids... My two older two who are over here and I love tremendously and I love them with every ounce that I have on the inside of me, they go to my bathroom when they have their own bathroom. Why do they do that? And I gotta use the bathroom. And Jesus understands your pain. Maybe you tried to get to church this morning and every bathroom was full. And maybe you're like, come on, would you hurry up? And my daughter, she got curly hair. She didn't know I was gonna do this. She got curly, curly hair, like kinky curly hair. And it takes her like an hour just to kind of like straighten it, get a comb through it, all that kind of stuff. And my son, he takes five minutes in the bathroom. He's a typical boy. Five minutes, boom, pitch, boom, feet, you're done, you're out, right? But my daughter got to spend like an hour up in there. And we'd be late everywhere we go. And Jesus understands your pain because he didn't grow up in a small household. He grew up in a big household. He got four brothers and at least two sisters and a mom and dad. They never got anywhere on time. I can promise you that. Let me move on. 
and they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home or his own town, among his relatives and his own home. He cannot do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. You've got to be careful doing the right thing in the wrong place. Jesus is doing the right thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. He finds himself in a dead end situation. And Jesus came because it's his family. And Jesus came because he loves them. And Jesus came because he wants to heal them. And Jesus came because he wants to forgive them. And Jesus came because he wants to redeem them and make them whole. But because of their lack of faith, he can't do anything. They kept Jesus. And Jesus starts to pour and it can't get in. It keeps running off. And Jesus keeps trying and he keeps trying to pour. It says that he went to teach on the Sabbath day and he, all he could do was just lay a, his hands on a few people. Because of their un. Belief. Everywhere he went, he was killing it. Chapter one, two, three, four, five. Killing it. People getting healed. Demons coming out. Arms being brought back to life. People that were dead being brought back to life. I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle. He gets to his hometown and they cap Jesus. And Jesus finds himself in a dead end situation. I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you've found yourself in a dead end situation. But God is not going to let what he put in you go to waste. He's calling you to make a U-turn. He's calling you to turn around. So I want to give you four things real quick. I don't know what time it is. What time is it? What time, what time do I need to be done? Anybody? I'll just, I'll just preach till I'm done. Number one is this. What we know about dead ends is that it's unexplainable. When you find yourself in a dead end situation, it's unexplainable. Mark chapter six, verse two through three. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's been performing? Isn't this the carpenter? They tried to explain an unexplainable anointing. They see Jesus and they say, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's boy? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the same Jesus that we saw 10 years ago? But you see, Jesus had an unexplainable anointing. When you got an unexplainable anointing, you walk differently. You talk differently. You, you speak differently. You look differently. You act differently. Why? Because there's an unexplainable anointing on your life. You can't explain the anointing. But I know this is that you've been to the mountain. You paid the price. You went up there when nobody else else was willing to go up to the mountain. You were on your knees praying at midnight and at two o'clock and at three o'clock you were fasting when nobody else wanted to fast. You were paying the price and there's this unexplainable anointing. Why are you different? Because you are willing to pay the price. People can't explain. When people can't explain your evolution, they try to expound on your past, don't they? Well, isn't this Jesus? Psh. I didn't come to church to, to hear some, some long hair. I don't have long hair, but I'm talking about Jesus, long haired Jesus. I didn't come here to the church to, 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 to hear my, my nephew preach. I didn't, I didn't come to, to know, to hear somebody preach that I knew in the past. I came to get God. And while they were trying to get God, their unbelief capped what God wanted to do in their life. You ever sat there in church? I don't like this song. Not my song. Why don't they sing the songs I like? Because you ain't the worship pastor, that's why. 
Why, 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 why don't they do it? The, why do they put this carpet in here? Why do they got lights the way they got lights? Why, why do they got all this kind of stuff? Why, what's happening? It's not the way that I want it. And you cap God because of your unbelief, because of your, your negativity, because of your so familiar with how things used to be. And God wants to change something up in your life. And Jesus finds himself in a dead end situation. You see, when you go to the wilderness, when you go to the place that nobody's willing to go to, you have an unexplainable anointing on your life to be different. And people are like, Jesus, I, I know you grew up here and you know, I watched you when you were a baby and I changed your diapers and, and, and you played with my kids and, and, and you went to high school with my kids and, and Jesus, but like, I know you left for a couple years, but where are your papers, bro? Where are your papers? Where are your papers that you're an ordained minister? Where are your papers that you went to school with? You see, we get so concerned with papers instead of oil. Let me say that again. We get so concerned with what we think is important instead of the oil, the anointing of God on your life. We get so concerned with the PhD and the doctorate that we have no oil in our life because we never went to the mountain. We just got an education. Where are your papers at, Jesus? Jesus, hear my papers. You want to know my papers? I went 40 days in the wilderness. I went 40 days without food. I went 40 days without water. I spent 40 days listening to the enemy telling me that I'm no good, that I'm a scoundrel, that I'm nothing. And I kept reminding him that I am the son of God. I kept reminding him who I am so that I can get to you. You see, you've got to pay the price. And when you pay the price, there's an unexplainable anointing. Number two, when you find yourself in a dead end situation. It's unexpected. When you find yourself in a dead end situation in life, a lot of times it's unexpected. Verse three, it says, isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't these his sisters with us? And they took offense to him. And Jesus said, a prophet is without honor. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town. Among his relatives and his own home, Jesus is called to love his family. Jesus is called not to neglect his house, but when the house neglects him, it's time to move on. See, people close to you sometimes can dishonor you because of their unbelief in you. They don't believe that you can do it. They dishonor you. They have unbelief, and so therefore they can't receive what God has for them. Honor is the culture of the kingdom. Did you know that? That's how God operates. Honor is the culture of the kingdom, and we need to honor what God has placed honor on. We say things like, well, not my president. No, he is your president, and you need to pray for him because he's gonna make mistakes. Well, I like the other guy better. Well, guess what, he made mistakes too. And the guy or girl after this president gonna make mistakes too. And you need to pray for them. You need to honor what God has placed honor on. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, love one another and brother, to me, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Honors God's law. It creates cult. When we create a culture of honor, it's a vehicle for God to bring a blessing in our life. When we honor God in belief, when we honor God in our tithes and offerings, when we honor God in our serving, when we honor God, God has now got a vehicle that he can bring a blessing in your life. Have you ever honored somebody that you didn't even know? Have you ever honored somebody that was a complete stranger and you honor them? Maybe somebody was walking down the sidewalk and they dropped something and you pick something up for somebody. Just being kind and being respectful. All of a sudden they, they turn to you and may, pat you on the back, say thank you, maybe give you a five. I mean, whatever it is, they, they start to honor you back. You see, honor is a culture that breeds honor. And Jesus walks into this situation and there's no honor. Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? The Ten Commandments 
There's 10 of them. Four of them honor God. The rest of the six, or the rest of the 10, honor man. Honor is important. Honor the office that God has placed. Honor on, honor leadership. Honor those that have lived longer than you. You know what gets kind of get up in my crawl, kind of gets me mad, gets me upset, is when I see young people dishonoring older people. Like, you ever gone to a restaurant before and people are waiting and the people are sitting down and you're sitting down and an older couple comes in and the young person doesn't stand for the older person? That drives me berserk. Drive me crazy. You're on the subway and there's like teenagers sitting down and there's a 70 year old man standing up who's a war vet who paid the price so that you could sit and you don't honor that person. That drives me crazy. Stand up. Honor that person. Honor breeds honor. No one's going to stick around where nobody is honored. Disagreement should never result in dishonor. Well, I disagree. I, I highly disagree. I highly disagree we should go in that direction. Guess what? I highly disagree with my wife every Sunday on where we're going to go eat. Highly disagree. When I say highly, almost every time. My wife will choose Mexican every Sunday after church. I will not choose Mexican after church on Sunday. I don't agree with her, but guess what? I'm going to honor her and we're going to go have Mexican and I'm going to have the best burrito and, and tacos you had ever had. Why? Because honor is important. Number three, when you find yourself in a dead end situation, it's unbelievable. It says in verse five, he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people to heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. You see, unbelief is a dead end and Jesus wants to pour his life into you, but because you have capped him, guess what? Now you have been given him dishonor and unbelief and Jesus can't get to you what he wants to give you. Anytime dishonor is displayed, it disrupts the supernatural. Anytime, every time. Why did Jesus kick them out of the house? Because they dishonored the man of God because of their unbelief. And he says, you got to go. You got to get out because I've got to get a miracle to this family. I've got to get a miracle to this little girl. I told you she was just asleep, but you didn't believe me. And because you didn't believe me, you got to go. And some of us are wrestling with doubt. And some of us are wrestling with unbelief. Doubt is a little bit different. Doubt is the struggle to figure out how God is gonna do it. I don't know how God's gonna do it, but I know God's gonna do it. I don't know how God is gonna heal this situation. I don't know how God is gonna take care of the finances. I don't know how God is gonna do this, but I know he's gonna do it. That's all that I'm responsible for is that God is going to do it. But unbelief is the determined refusal to believe. And Jesus is trying desperately to pour into your life. He's trying to forgive you. He's trying to heal you. He wants to heal you of that disease and of that mind sickness. He wants to heal you of that pain and that struggle and that storm that you're going through. But unbelief is your determined refusal to believe. Unbelief is the condition of the unbeliever. Unbelief is the act that says, I choose to absolutely refuse that God can do it. I reject what you're saying all together. If you have to keep explaining yourself away, it's time to move on. If you have to keep explaining yourself away, it's time to get out of the situation. And Jesus says, all right, I got to move my jug. I came because I love you. I came because I wanted to see, to see deliverance in your home. I, I came because I, I wanted to heal you but I have to go because of your unbelief. And Jesus steps away. So number four is this. When you find yourself in a dead end situation, it's time for the U-turn. Mark chapter six, verse six. It says that Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Did you know that in the beginning of chapter six, Jesus couldn't do anything? 
But by the time you get to the end of chapter six, it's the same chapter that Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's the same chapter that Jesus walks on water. It's the same anointing, just a different place. And Jesus has got an anointing that he wants to set you free. Jesus has got an anointing that he wants to change your life. I need three guys real quick. I need three people real quick. Can I, can I have three guys just to stand right here real quick? Three, three, the third, fastest three, three people. Not guys, eight girls. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three, here we go. I want you guys to turn this way right here. Face this way. They're going in this direction. Tell me your name, sir. Oscar, tell me your name. Tell me your name. Brian. Oscar Jose Brian. Y'all didn't get the memo? You didn't get the memo? Okay. Got some Spanish guys, and then we got, we got Brian over here. They're facing this way. What direction is this? Anybody tell me? South. south. It's south. I would, this wasn't a, it wasn't a trick question. I had no idea. So they're facing south. You're going this way. You're going this way. You're going this way. You're in the lead position. You're in the second position. Get directly behind him for me. Scoot over just a little bit. There we go. You don't like what you see. It's not going in the direction you want it to go in. It's not going in your favor. You're in last place. Guess what? All you got to do is turn around. Everybody turn around. So you just change your position. Now you're in first place. You see, when you change your direction, you change your position, you go from last to first. Come on, somebody give it up for Brian, Jose, Oscar. Come on, give it up for them. You guys can be seated. All you got to do is change your position and it changes your direction. Change your direction, it changes your position. And Jesus changes the situation and it says that he goes from not being able to do anything to feeding 5,000. Not just 5,000, but their families. He goes from not being able to do anything to walking on water. You got to change your direction, baby. You got to put your arm up over the back of that chair, pack it up, put it in reverse. Maybe you got to push on the gas pedal and just fling around as fast as you can. You got to get up out of there. Maybe you're in a situation at work and it's a dead end situation. It's time to make a U-turn. Maybe you're in a dead end situation. Maybe you're, you're, you're about to get married to somebody you ain't about to marry or supposed to marry. You need to get up out of that situation. You see, maybe, maybe you are in a bad situation in your mind, in your health. It's time to make a U-turn. God is saying, I want to heal you, but it's time to make a U-turn. It's time for you to change. I want to heal your body, but you got to put the cigarettes down. I, I want to heal you from diabetes, but you got to stop eating the donuts. I, I want to heal you and you, you need to start working out. Maybe you got to start walking a couple extra miles every day. God wants to do something for you. He wants to pour into you, but you've capped him. It's time to make a U-turn. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. I've been told that there are diseases, skin diseases, and even diseases that can get in your body if you stand in the wrong dirt. Just dirt. It's time to dust the dirt off your feet and move in a different direction direction. It's time to come out from dishonor. It's time to give honor where honor is due. You see, you need to master the moments that God has given you. And when you go to the place that you're called to go to, all of a sudden things start to change. Jesus was capped in one situation. Remember when I told you when he pours out, when he pours into you, he's not going to let it go to waste. I need a couple people to stand up right now. You've been to the mountain. You've been praying. You've been believing. If you've been standing in the gap, you've been praying and believing. I want you to stand up right now. You've been praying for a miracle. It's not your, it's not your time to be quiet. It's not your time to be shy. This is what God does. He takes what they capped what was spilled out that nobody received, 
Because you've been to the mountain, God says, I'm about to take what they didn't get. I'm about to take what they didn't want, and I'm about to pour it into your bucket. I'm about to pour it into your jar. Why? Because I've called you to be an overflower. There's somebody in this room that's about to receive a double portion. There's somebody in this room that's about to go to a whole nother level. Why? Because of your belief. Because you didn't cap God. I want to know if there's somebody in here that's ready for your miracle. I want to know if there's somebody in here that's ready to go further than you've ever gone. I want to know if there's somebody in here ready to receive what God has for you. God is saying, I'm ready and willing. I not just only can heal the sick. I not just only can heal diseases and forgive sins, but I can be everywhere at all times. I can be in your mind. I can heal your body. I can heal your soul. I can heal your spirit. Jesus said, it's time. It's time to go. It's not time to stay. It's time to move forward. It's time to put it in reverse and make a U-turn. It's time to get up out of your dead end situation. And it's time to go where I've called you to go. It's time to do what I've called you to do. It's time to believe for that miracle for your child and to kick out the doubt and unbelief. It's time to pursue what God has for you. Thanks so much for watching. If this message encouraged you, be sure to join again at one of our many Church Online experiences live every weekend. Just click watch live in the description below. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, click the connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video. Maybe even share it with one of your friends. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember with Jesus, you are destined to win.